Good morning. Today I'm joined by Rupert Lowe, who is a member of the Brexit Party uh, and now also a newly elected member of the European Parliament. Rupert, thanks very much for, for joining me. Good to see you. Yeah, good to be here. Uh, today, obviously, we're going to speak about uh, Brexit. You were very much on the, uh, on the Leave side of, of Brexit. You're now part of the Brexit Party. Take someone from, you know, from we're sitting over here in Australia, we read a lot of media about Brexit. Um, some not so flattering about what Brexit actually entails. Can you give us the, the, the rundown of why uh, the UK should leave the European Union? Well, the first thing is that to say is the Brexit Party is a newly formed party, so it only formed six weeks ago, six, seven weeks but ago. But it's had, it's had it's great, quite, quite incredible great success. considering what we, what we achieved in the European elections recently. So we, in the West Midlands where I stood, we polled 38% of the vote, which for a party that's set up six weeks before is unheard of in the UK. And three members in, in Parliament? We've got 29 members now in, in the European Parliament, of which I'm one. We s I take up my seat in, in the European Parliament on the 2nd of July when I go to Strasbourg. So for a, a party basically from, from nothing, when the government failed to deliver Brexit, because as Brexit, the issue on Brexit was the people were asked, do they want to remain as part of the European Union or do they want to leave the European Union? The government then gave uh, all sorts of what was called project fear, saying that people should vote to remain. But no, the British people decided they wanted to leave, and they voted 52-48 to leave. And then we then watched a farce of a negotiation taking place in our name, which is it's either duplicitous or it's incompetent, and neither of those is acceptable. And we ended up then, we were told a hundred and I think it was five times by Theresa May, the Prime Minister, that we would leave on the 29th of March with or without a deal. And she repeated it over and over again, and she kept saying, no deal is better than a bad deal. And then on the 29th of March, we didn't leave at all. They got one extension, we then had another extension. And I think the British people who ultimately, this is about democracy now, it's about whether, if you ask the people what they want and they tell you what you don't want to hear, you've still got to deliver it because the people in the end are the masters, not the servants. They're the ones, their vote is their only stake in society. And if you take that away, people get angry. So why such reluctance at the political front? Because the European Union is a project, it's a post-war project. It, it, it came out of what's called the European Coal and Steel Community. Uh, the Marshall Plan, which your, a lot of your viewers may or may not know about, was it was a post-war plan, very unselfish plan by the the, the victors, the basically the Anglo-Saxon alliance, which was largely driven by America, but also with our support. And instead, France started to, to, to damage Germany's interests by breaking up her steelmaking and her coal industry. The Marshall Plan reversed that. And in 1947, they formed this European coal and steel community, which ultimately helped rebuild Europe. America did the same thing with Japan. So we built, rebuilt their economies as a, as a a demand mechanism for American manufactured goods. So we, they were basically rehabilitated at, at some cost mm. by the victors. Not very often that the victors do that sort of thing. <laughs> and then out of that also, I think, there was a post-war move to avoid uh, the nation state. They thought the nation state, because we'd seen uh, in the past Napoleon trying to, the French trying to take over Europe, and then we had the Kaiser in the First World War, and then we had Hitler in the Second World War, these sort of nation states became aggressive. So I think the general view of the elite, the post-war elite, was they wanted to crush the nation state and create this European super state. And that, you've seen that happening. If you watch what their hands are doing, the whole thing's built on deceit. It's not, it's not honest. It couldn't be honest because the people who fought and died in the war for democracy would not have supported uh, a super state, an unaccountable super state, which is what, which is what we now have. So it's all been built on deceit. and. It's an incredibly powerful force. And the British people, funny enough, I, I think are about to save Europe from itself yet again, because they have gone against their government and they have voted to leave the European Union. There's no need, in my view, to conflate trade with sovereignty. So what, what our people want is they want to trade with Europe. They don't want to stop trading with Europe. And there's no reason why Europe would, because Europe has a 95 billion pound surplus with, 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 with Britain. So we buy 95 billion pounds worth of goods more from them than they buy from us. So, you know, Germany calls us the Golden Isle, I think, because we buy so many German cars, and we are a massive export market for them. So actually, 
the European Union is not doing a service for its people by not doing a proper trade deal with us. It's more in their interest than ours. So we don't want to stop trading. We want to continue trading. We just want our sovereignty back. We want our country back. We want our, fortunately, we still have our currency because people like me stood for the referendum party in 97, so it's my second foray into politics to, to try and make common sense prevail. Um, and we saved the pound. That was the best thing we could have done. And you're now seeing the euro grinding all these southern European countries into penuries. So, so if you go to Italy or Greece or Spain or Portugal, you know, they're now locked into the Deutsche Mark through the euro. Even France is struggling. You know, I don't know if you've read about the gilet jaune. The, 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 the it's not covered very well in, in the UK, I don't, for whatever reason, but it's a fairly major event. And it's, it's reflective of the fact that, again, Germany's economy is so much more competitive than all these other countries that if they remain locked into this currency block, they will just effectively be ground into the dust. In the old days, you had currency adjustments. So if they were less productive, their currency would depreciate, and that's like a shock absorber. So they're locked in, and, and you're now seeing, you know, you've got Salvini in Italy. You've got the beginnings of they're talking about running a parallel currency. Uh, you know, Greece effectively should have declared bankruptcy. That would have been the right thing in 2015, mm -hmm. but it, 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 it couldn't do that because the German banks and the French banks were owed too, owed too much money. So the whole construct of the, the European post-war plan, I think, is now, it's defunct in, the, in that things have moved on. I think the digital revolution has, in my view, released into the individual rather than having a super state structure. I mean, the super states tend to fail. I mean, the Soviet Union mm -hmm. failed. Uh, socialist operations like Venezuela, which should be one of the richest countries in the world, mm -hmm. has failed. Uh, ultimately, what, what I think we want is sovereign nations with their own currency and their own trading arrangements. And Britain is extremely well placed with the Commonwealth and with all our historical links to the rest of the world to actually trade very, very effectively. We don't need to be part of uh, a block which is incredibly slow to negotiate trade deals. It's, it's got all sorts of differing vested interests across, across the continent. And I think whilst I, I emphasize we don't want to stop trading with Europe, uh, indeed I would argue that after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, Europe had its golden period when we effectively ensured there was peace in Europe for everybody to trade. We didn't want to invade or take over other people's countries. We just wanted a free trade zone, and it was incredibly successful until, again, the First World War. So, so trade and sovereignty are two entirely different issues. But the issue we face in the UK is one of democracy. And it doesn't really matter now whether you're a Remainer or a Lever, whether you're a Liberal, a Labour, or a Tory. Ultimately, this is about democracy, and if people vote, and they're given a vote, a referendum, which we had in June 16, and they deliver a verdict, whether it's a verdict that the government likes or doesn't like, the civil service likes or doesn't like, the elite likes or doesn't like, ultimately, you cannot not deliver on that result. And so what's happened so far, that result has not been delivered. Absolutely, and we've been three years on since it's that it's three referendum years date. What is the... You know, where does it go from here? What's the what's what's the time frame of having a resolution here, and what is the you know what does that resolution look like in your eyes? Well, so the British people, with the Brexit Party, and this is what's so extraordinary, but for us to poll what we polled in the European elections and to get 29 members into the European Parliament was incredible, and we're still polling very very highly. In in, in if there if there were a general election, you know we're at the moment of the last poll, I think we were 20 seats short of an overall majority. And again, this is a party that's two months so old now. Un exactly. Incredible. I mean, it's a, it's a theme we're seeing around so the world. So what that's doing is that's putting incredible pressure on the, on the, on the recalcitrant, reluctant uh, deliverers of the referendum result, which is the existing establishment in Westminster. And what you've really got is a, a, a if you like, disjoint between the people and, and our parliament in Westminster. And so... Westminster reluctantly now is, so the Tories now, as you know, Theresa May has resigned. We've got various people running for, uh, the, the Prime Minister it will be, uh, Boris Johnson's Boris Johnson, favourite. Yeah. Uh, and there he's saying now, I don't, want, I don't want no trade, I want trade, I want free trade agreement, but we are going to leave on October the 31st, which happens to be my birthday. <laughs> um, so 
You, we are. We're having Boris is saying, as I understand it, he doesn't want a, a no-deal Brexit. He wants no, to get things Nobody down. wants a no-deal Brexit. A no-deal Brexit is not logical or commonsensical. It's, it's a stupid thing. And, and for Europe to say they're going to punish the English, mm. I mean, look, we're the, we're the second biggest contributor to the EU budget. We, our economy is the equivalent of the, of the size of the 19 smallest members of the EU. So if we leave, or when we leave, it's not, it's not dropping from 20 se 28 to 27, it's dropping from, from 28 to 9, whatever it is. Mm. So ultimately, we are a massive uh, economy. We're, we have a massive trade deficit, 95 billion pounds with the rest of Europe. They should want to do a free tra trade deal with us. If they're doing a responsible thing for their citizens, mm. you know, it's not like the Soviet bloc where they used to build a wall and keep people in. Uh, you know, th they should embrace this. They should say, fine, British people want their sovereignty back. We're confident in, Dara in what we're doing. And if in 10 years' time the British have got it wrong and they want to come back, that's fine. That's what you do if you're secure. Mm. But the problem is they're not secure because the euro is, is, is not sustainable. This, this brings me to the next question. So uh, we assume that the Brexit does happen. Um, and well, it and has to happen. It has to happen. If, if um, it doesn't happen, the, the Brexit party will win the next general election. That's, what that's my prediction. What does it look like in terms of Europe? You've touched on Europe, um, you know, the, 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 the issues with a, a shared currency, with so many um, economies, different economies with different variables in them. Um, you know, what does Europe look like after this? Um, and, you know, you've obviously you've had a very successful business career. You've run a, a football club. You've, you, you're an active investor around the globe. Um, you know, what does it look like in Europe from an investment standpoint? Well, I, I, I think if you're German, it's currently very good because you're effectively trading with an undervalued currency. So if you were on the Deutsche Mark, you, your, your, your currency would be a lot higher. And actually, in counterintuitively, the only, in my view, the only resolution for the euro is for Germany to leave and go back to the Deutsche Mark. And, and effectively, she runs her own currency block, and then the euro block becomes a weak euro mm. rather than the other way around. A strong euro. euro so, so effectively, yeah. the euro then allows those countries to float against Germany. Mm. That, that I think is, is, is the resolution. So, the answer to your question is Germany's doing, she's doing relatively well, but then Germany currently has a problem in that she's a huge manufacturer of cars. She's got all the legacy uh, costs and, 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 and infrastructure which she's got from, from this massively successful car industry. And you're seeing a huge metamorphosis in cars from the, the internal combustion engine to mm -hmm. either hybrids or electric. And so Germany uh, has got, I think, some, I've got some concerns about her economy, but at the moment the Euro's allowing her to trade at a discounted level. So Presumably, her currency would yeah. be higher. The rest which of the Which would European be a negative for German manufacturing which if which they were to break up. It, w it would, but again, Germany's never suffered. She, she quite liked a strong Deutsche Mark. And in fact, I don't blame the Germans because it was the French who insisted the Germans join the Euro. The, Germ the, Fr the Germans didn't want to join it, they wanted to keep the Deutsche Mark, which would actually would have been the best thing. So the, uh, what do I see in Europe? I see, as I said, the Italian economy is being ground into the dust by the Euro. The French economy is in big trouble, and, and I don't think France knows whether she's a Northern European or a Southern Euro European nation. She's, she's, a, she's neither fish nor fowl. She's, She's got her head in the north of Europe, but she's also got a huge amount of her body in the south of Europe. Uh, then you've got Spain, and you've got Portugal, and you've got Greece, and you've got all these other countries, and quite a lot of, of ex-communist countries have come into the bloc. And I noticed, you know, one or two of them are now trying to suggest they shouldn't join the euro. And I, so I think they're seeing the error of the way. So it's not this nirvana that you join up and, you know, you, you've got a sort of solid currency block. You haven't. You've got a, a, a continent in crisis because central planners have tried to impose their will on sovereign democracies and sovereign economies and it doesn't work we know central planning doesn't work you know you you've got to let the individual flourish mm. and you've got to respect the rights of the individual let them take the decisions and take the market risk the, the job of government is not to intervene in everybody's daily lives all the time it's to make sure that we have obviously the right defense we have the right tax collection. We have the, you know, we, we have to be fair, and we have create a society that it, that does look after those people who can't look after themselves. But after that, you've just got to let people interface freely together. That's that works. When you get central planning, you get people making bad decisions at the top table, and that has huge impact on on the rest of the economy. So I, I think I do think the European Union is now, it's an outdated concept, but it's incredibly powerful. And it's got a lot of 
what I would call momentum. You know, if you score a try, it carries you over. If you dive for the line, it carries you over the line. Well, they've still got momentum because they've still got this intellectual arrogance to think that they know better, that Nanny knows best. So for me, I, I, I want to see Brexit delivered. I want my own sovereign currency, my own sovereign parliament, and I want free trade with the rest of the world. And th that, I think, is the formula that will serve Britain well. And, and we have some of the most inventive and creative and fantastic people. We just got to let them, let them flourish and let them do the job, which they will do. Europe, though, I, I think, I think it's going to find it very difficult to recover from from this straitjacket of the euro, which was really the last throw of the dice for the for the the central planner, planners who failed to deliver political union. And they thought, well, anyway, we can keep this project going is to force monetary or try and force mm -hmm. monetary union. And uh, my, uh, I would argue that they have actually, they, they're guilty of a crime against quite a large part of Southern Europe in terms of destroying their livelihoods, uh, creating poverty for them, uh, generally damaging their country. I, I, I think what's happened is, is an absolute disgrace, but you, they, they, at the end of the day, they justify it on this grand post-war plan. So um, I'm looking forward to taking out my seat in July, and uh, I, I go off to Strasbourg for the, for the first uh, session. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I think most of it closes down for August, and then we start again in earnest in September. So it'll be fun. So the back end of year will be be, uh, be an inter be, interesting be, well, period. As I say, hopefully we'll have left by October, and I will mm. be um, I will be living in a sovereign nation for your birthday, <laughs> with free <laughs> trade agreements with the rest of the world. <laughs> look, look at you. Look at Australia. You have. It's wonderful to be here. You've got your own economy, your own currency. You're proud of. Aus everyone's proud of Australia. You Certainly know, you come are. here. You talk to people in the street, they love being here, and they, they are all positive about life. So that's, it's great to be here. Rupert, it's a fascinating topic. I could talk for, talk for a lot longer than we have, but thanks again for joining us. My and pleasure. Uh, and safe travels home. Very good to see you.